Hello, I'm Odin, and I'm doing QuarantCon. This is going to be the second time. That's welcome to my live stream. What I'm going to be doing today is uh, I'm fiddling with a helmet that I had worked with previously. I might talk about uh, some of the things that I do when I'm working on my show that I don't usually go over on the show, kind of a tips and tricks. But the main thing I really wanted to do today was interact with you, because that's something I don't ever do. I want to be open for questions and answers. I've got some people helping me uh, to actually get the questions to me. I'm I'm currently broadcasting, uh, if you want to call it broadcasting, out of my shop. I have one cameraman here with me, but practicing proper social distancing. I've got my family at home monitoring the, uh, the multiple live streams because I'm on both YouTube and Facebook currently. So each one's on a different chat room and they'll be texting me the questions that come up because I don't know if I'm going to be able to actually catch everything on my own. Uh, I did have one to start with because I had uh, posted on my Reddit that, uh, you know, my Reddit page, that I was going to be doing this. And Wandamian, what is it? Wandamian, uh, pardon, well, I can't pronounce this, I'm sorry. <laughs> he just wants to know, do I have templates for all of my, all of my projects? And if so, because he wants to do Stormbreaker without templates, he's not sure if he'd be able to do it. I'm assuming he uh, could be wrong. Most of my projects I do have templates for. I try to post them whenever I actually get them finished. Uh, my templates are typically posted as part of the video. It'll be in the description. Specifically Stormbreaker, I've got some, um, the templates aren't as complete. It's just most of the, t uh, the axe head. Uh, the handle there's no template for because it's an organic group stick. Uh, I haven't actually collected all of my templates in the one spot and I'm considering making a page, probably at least on my Patreon, and we're currently under construction for making an odinmakes.com and all the templates will definitely be stored there and they're all gonna remain free because um, I don't really think I have the rights to sell templates for two properties I don't have. So I'm not going to do that and I'm not going to poke that lion. <laughs> the second question he had was, um, oh, how to achieve, uh, what is the best way to achieve clean angles when cutting foam without using a bandsaw? Which is a great question. So the best way to achieve clean angles cutting foam without a bandsaw is actually making sure you have a sharp blade. Sharp blade is the number one thing that is going to make foam life easier, if you want to call it that. Uh, let's see. It's black, so it's a little harder to see. But where did I put my blade? Oh, wow, that's funny. <laughs> hey, let's go live, and I'm going to misplace stuff. So I just have a basic snap-off blade. Uh, this one's got a, a bit of a 30 degree angle on it, so it looks more like an X-Acto knife. This is actually made by Excel, which has got some really good blades. Uh, the main thing you want to do is keep it sharp. Even though I've used this blade a few times, I have my Kershaw uh, knife honer and just a few, couple little bits of... This is like a $10 tool and totally worth it. Then I'm making sure as I look at it, I'm not actually 90 degrees. So let me try a little harder here since I'm trying to do this right. I want to hold my hand at 90 degrees because if you, it's easy to cut wonky. And when you cut wonky and glue things together, you're going to end up with seams that kind of buckle a little, little bit. Depending on the look you're going for, you probably don't want that. So as much as I can, I want to hold it straight. I've got the blade hopefully sharpened. So I should be able to do with some pressure one cut and I've got a fairly clean, sharp cut, and that's pretty close to 90. So that'll actually glue really easily, and that is, that is the most fundamental thing. And you can see there's no power tools involved here. I've got a cutting mat to preserve the tip of the, of the knife. Uh, this is the main thing. This is what you really want to have. I really like these smaller blades uh, as far as the size of the knife, right? Because you can also get the larger snap-off blades. These are great too, but there's a difference camera may not be able to see it, the blades are actually a little bit thicker. So it takes a little more effort to push them through the foam. Still works, still works just fine. And this, this knife is fantastic for cutting up floor mats. So if you want to go to Harbor Freight Tools and buy a bunch of the floor mat, this is great. But when you start getting into the higher density foams, uh, this is TNT Cosplay Foam, there's also the SKS Props HD Foam, which is easily my favorite foam. Uh, this knife, these thinner blade knives are definitely a lot easier to use. 
and there's nothing wrong with these guys. These are just fine too. Uh, I usually use these for thinner foams, not quite the, the full centimeter thick, you know, the, the two millimeter, four millimeter, but these work great too. And if you're delicate, same thing. Got a text. Christopher Hunt asks, as an amateur builder, what tools and such, such should he buy? And, well, as an amateur builder, the only thing you really need are a sharp blade and contact cement, basically, and foam, and then your artistic ingenuity. You can decorate it any way you want. So don't get caught up on, I have to buy exactly the right paint. No, you can buy craft paint. I really like the Plaid FX uh, craft paint. I really like, um, Plastidip as a way of sealing foam so I can then spray paint it. And those are two totally separate techniques. Plastid, uh, the, the Plaid FX paints are flexible and they won't crack during use, as far as I've seen. Spray paint can. So if you're doing armor and helmet and things that really need to flex, spray paint is likely going to crack, uh, probably fairly quickly. Uh, static props, I haven't seen a problem. But tools, you need a sharp knife, you need a straight edge, you want something to, in my opinion, you want something to protect your surface. So if you're just starting out, use cardboard. Uh, and then um, I prefer contact cement over hot, uh, hot glue. Hot glue totally works. And if you want to just practice, use hot glue. But if you ever want to put it into your car and go to a con, it may not survive the trip because cars get warm. So contact cement is what you want to use. But really, that's, that's, that's it. There's, you know, there's templates all over the place. I have them, Punish Props has them, uh, Evil Ted has them, uh, Heroes Unlimited has them. You can get templates all over the place to make the stuff you want to make. And I've got Thurman asks, uh, no, Thurminal asks, where can I get good fur from? Trying to get good prices on fur. Wow, fur is an amazingly great question. Let's see. There was a while, many years ago, there was a place that if you ordered 10 yards of fur, you could get custom fur. And I wish I remembered what that link was because, man, that'd be awesome. Um, you're going to have to probably either look online or if you're in a larger city, you can go to what, what can be considered the garment district. Uh, if you only need a little bit of fur, the one thing that I've done for making uh, Muppets and, and making accents on, on little pieces of costume when I needed really kind of specific, better looking fur than what you typically see in, in a craft store or in a fabric store. Nothing against fabric stores, there's just certain f furs that they continuously have, right? Go to the Goodwill and buy a stuffed animal. You can get some fantastic looking furs from stuffed animals. You can get some long shaggy ones, you can get some shorter ones. And uh, we've got some really good, you know, Fraggle Rock floppy Muppet hair by sacrificing a few plushies. I'm being asked if I locally source my supplies in foam or do I so the answer is yes, I do, uh, and do they shape, ship nationwide? To my knowledge, um, let's see, the two main that I know of for, for ordering and having stuff shipped is TNT Cosplay and SK, SKS Props with HD Foam. HD Foam is available through uh, Blick Materials, on uh, Blick Art Materials, that's, that's online. I actually have an affiliate link. I should place that I haven't but uh, which would help me but you don't have to use that uh, Blake art constantly has free shipping which is fantastic TNT cosplay fulfills their own shipments and they might ship internationally uh, I'm I'm still domestic for them so I, I don't know uh, but they are an independent business that does their own independent shipping out of Dallas Texas and they're some really nice people so those are the main two that I know I've seen there are I haven't needed an order from them, so I can't speak fully, but I know there is a cosplay supply company based out of Australia that uh, sells a number of uh, foams and foam clays and materials, as well as, it's not polyfoam, but something like that. They're in the UK, and, and they sell a lot of the materials uh, as well. So do they ship internationally out of the US? I don't know, but I know of at least a few other distributors in some of the other English-speaking countries, I can read their websites, that uh, supply foam. Joshua Hughes is asking, how much do I need to know about electronics when I'm doing a prop with LEDs or soundboards? 
Okay, so let me be totally honest. Electronics and LEDs, not my strong point. If you, if you haven't noticed when watching my videos, and this would be kind of fun to keep in the back of your head if you do actually watch any of them, I just rewire flashlights. That's mostly what I do. Um, because those are circuits that work, and I know they work. And, and too often I have hooked up too much power to a single poor LED and just burnt it right out. Uh, how much do you need to know? A lot of this stuff, thankfully, is online. When I did my lightsaber uh, build for Beyond Geek, which is available on the Beyond Geek channel if you want to see it, I've done a couple of them there, I did all the research online as to how to actually wire it up. Uh, I didn't just intrinsically, intrinsically know. Um, it takes a little bit to learn how to read wiring diagrams. I still can't really, but... Uh, Mostly, with what I've seen for, for getting stuff done for props, it's not that difficult, uh, so long as I have instructions on how to do it. But it, that's just, it's certainly not my strong point. The Jacksmith is asking, when did I start making props and what inspired me to start making props? All right, we can go along here. No. Um, Honestly, being uh, costuming and, and crafty is just something I've kind of always done. Uh, I grew up with a fairly creative family. My dad was an engineer and kind of an inventor. Uh, he, he worked on little things like those stairs that fold out from a bus that, uh, to pick up wheelchairs and bring them back in. Uh, it wasn't initially his design, but he got one of the first really working ones that became mass produced for the flexible brand buses. But, um, what got me interested in costumes and interested in props really was Godzilla and Star Wars. Uh, I can remember one of the first costumes I worked on, if you want to call it working on, I uh, was, was Chewbacca because Star Wars, Wars had come out uh, and <laughs> Star Wars. So mom sewed together a fur suit using craft store fur, so I kind of looked like a, I don't know, didn't look like a Wookiee, I looked like a fuzzy brown fur thing. Craft but, store um, fur like, you know, uh, uh, what I can remember talking about is the bandolier that, that goes on Chewbacca, because that's the important thing to be Chewbacca and not just Sasquatch. Um, and I was talking about how I wanted to take Dad's hard pack cigarettes that were empty and just wrap up with aluminum foil and we could tape them onto a belt. And that's how we made the first, uh, the first bandolier for my first Chewbacca costume. And it just kept going from there. Uh, the 80s is really where props came in more for me because of Return of the Jedi and then Tom Savini book Bizarro and, and horror movies. And I loved rubber monsters and I was really into makeup and a little bit of horror effects uh, at the time. And for a while I did a lot of plaster casts of my face and friends' faces and making different uh, you know, latex masks and, and, and makeups did a lot of stuff for Rocky Horror Picture Show. So it's been kind of all along, and it was a lot of fun learning this stuff years before the internet, when all I could do is go to the library and, and, and look at old makeup books. There's Tom Savini's book and Fangoria Magazine. And then there's a really fun old one called Cinemagic. I, anymore, but, uh, I don't know how easy that is. To... Uh, Tyler Bloom is asking, how would I cut a bevel that is about six inches wide? The prop is supposed to have a really wide and worn look. Um, well, that's interesting. So are you specifically cutting like a yoga block, something that's already six inches wide to begin with? So if I needed to cut a bevel on something like that, depending on the thickness of the foam, I would either tilt the table on my bandsaw, or if I was using uh, the polyfoam, like what's in your couch, I would literally use an electric carving knife, like what you would use on a turkey for uh, Thanksgiving, because that is easily the, one of the best uh, power tools for that type of foam. Because uh, it's that, that soft, creamy, colored, open cell foam. But uh, chances are you can build it hollow. So if you need to do a six inch bevel on something, is it a, uh, a box shape that can be hollow where you're just taking your uh, centimeter wide uh, foam and you can cut the bevel you want down one side with any kind of a razor knife and then you glue it together and you start making a box where the factory edge is your bevel, because that's going to be the clean edge. What you want to do is, is do some sort of a cut and put your glue where your cut is, because that's going to be the rougher edge. And then you have your uh, long bevel going out that way. Um, I'm actually planning on starting up doing a buster sword in a couple of weeks, because Final Fantasy is coming out. So I'll be doing a bevel on that. Uh, but I'll probably be using a bandsaw for it in order to get that really thin, thin bevel, because I've been able to get that to work. But um, it depends on the angle of the bevel and how the shape's working. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Oh, another thing you could do is layer up a bunch of cuts. So if you're able to do a bunch of cuts, even by hand, uh, in order to layer them like steps. I know there's no, be there's a, no bevel here if you, 90 degrees is a bevel. But you start layering them up and then you could take two mil foam, we'll sand it, right? And then you take two mil foam and glue that over it to cover over all of your cut marks. And that should help a little bit. Christopher Hunt is asking, how do I deal with the frustration during a build? Sometimes I get so frustrated and discouraged. This is an awesome question. How do I deal with the frustration? I leave the shop. That's one of the first things I do. Because uh, if I don't, I'll get really mad and sometimes break stuff. Um, the hardest beast to fight while you're doing any kind of artistic effort, whether it's foam building or painting or sewing or anything, is the perfectionist eye of the artist yourself. You're fighting your, your mind's eye idea of what it should be and not necessarily what's being created with your hands. And that is really hard to get past. And it's still hard for me to get past. Uh, there's, there's, um, there's the idea of I'm making something and I'm hyper-focusing on the details, but somebody else, when they see what I've done, when it's all completed and together, they see the thing as a whole. And they may not even notice the fact that my buckle is askew, which would drive me nuts, but it, it doesn't matter. Or sometimes it's assumed that was done on purpose to go for the character. Uh, so uh, the biggest one is to understand that you are your harshest critic, and everyone else won't be looking at the parts that you don't like or won't be remembering your feelings or the frustration while you're working on it. They just see your finished product project and are generally very impressed with that. That's the best thing I can say, and I think that's answering the question. Tyler Henson asks, what's my favorite thing that I made? Wow, that one's tough. Uh, usually it's the last project that I got done. I'm really happy with my uh, Half-Life Gravity gun. That one I'm really pleased with. I'm ex uh, ecstatic about my, uh, my, my, soul, my soul Edge Blade from Soul Calibur. Um, one of the biggest projects that I've done that's years ago that I can probably dig up pictures for, but not during the live stream, I actually got to build a Star Trek bridge, uh, original series. It was a little under scale. It was built to fit the room that we were in, but... Um, that actually had working turbo lift doors. It had uh, four or five workstations along the back wall. It didn't have the step down because we were just inside of a building, so it was a flat. So it wasn't really the Enterprise, it was the USS Prime Directive. Uh, and then instead of a captain's chair, it was double wide for the two main stars, so it was a captain's couch. It had no helm station. So that was something that I was really happy with because I got to build an original series Star Trek set and it worked and that was fun. <clears throat> Uh, what is this? We've got Daryl Helmer is asking, I've never worked with EVA foam because I don't have a garage or a workshop, and I'm concerned about using a heat gun. Advice or suggestions? Okay. No, that's, that's great. I have a friend in Monterey who's possibly watching now. Hello, Jerry. Uh, he lives in an apartment and has made full Titan armor with fur on folding TV trays in his apartment living room, and he uses a heat gun. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, contact cement has a little bit of fumes, and the heat gun draws more power than a hair dryer, so you want to make sure it's a different outlet than your microwave. But other than that, it's not a big deal. Uh, have a window open for a little bit of, uh, you know, so you got some fresh air moving through, right? You don't want to be totally shut up in an apartment and, and fuming yourself, because there's a bit of a smell with contact cement. Um, but you can totally work in, in the smallest area that you have comfort in. Uh, the dining room table's fine. Uh, TV trays are fine. I've got this set up because I need a set for my YouTube show. If uh, I wasn't doing that, I'd be working off my coffee table watching TV. So it's, it's, you can work wherever you want. I built a wooden Dalek in the back porch of my uh, apartment back in, oh, what, 94? So, um, you know, whatever's, uh, whatever space you have, you can utilize. And I wouldn't be afraid of a heat gun. Uh, it gets hotter than a, than a hair dryer, so it'll definitely burn your hand if you grab the wrong end. But um, they're, they're not that big of a deal. Here's a question from Starius Prime, someone who has seen the, uh, the Star Trek set. How would I handle creating a prop that was reflective, such as an old school Cylon head or helmet? Wow, that's an awesome question. <clears throat> All right, chrome is the single biggest uh, issue 
with doing any kind of cosplay. And then you're also fighting uh, expectation versus what the camera is actually seeing. Most cosplay, not all of it, but most cosplay is based off of something that was shot on a camera, right? Video games aren't, and comic books aren't, but whatever. So if you're working off a television show or a, or a movie, like say Battlestar Galactica, where you have something that's vacuum metallicized to be insanely chromed and reflective, that is, yeah, it's a bit difficult to do at home. Um, the single best method that I've seen, you can't actually do on foam, it has to be on a hard material, is uh, all clad. And all clad is done with an airbrush. It is a uh, transparent chrome uh, application. It's, it's silver, I'm uh, calling it chrome, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bright silver to put over a gloss black. So you need as perfect of a surface as you can get. Uh, do a shiny gloss black, and because it's gloss and shiny, it's going to show off all the imperfections. That's why you need to be really careful with how much puttying and sanding you do. And once that's dry, you go back and do a little bit of uh, airbrush over it for the silver. And you can get a stunning chrome effect um, using your airbrush. Now, expectations versus reality. Something that I have seen and that I just saw Adam Savage talk about on Tested is uh, most of the stuff in movies, Cylons are an exception, aren't that shiny of a chrome because it reflects all the equipment back to the camera and it reflects wild light back to the camera. A lot of it is done with, um, there's, there's rub and buff, uh, there's, there's the brighter silver paints, and then there's layers of paint application put onto it in order to create a chrome-like effect that then looks brighter on camera than it actually does in person. Uh, which is which is a bit of a trick and a bit of a lie, but that's that's filmmaking. Filmmaking literally is smoke and mirrors. So, from what I've seen, um, getting a really really good chrome is really hard. The one thing that uh, William Shakespeare enjoys doing is using his uh, Markson. I can't remember the name of the pen right now, but there is a really good chrome ink. That, that he's been using. You can get the refill bottles and he paints with that and it gets a really good chrome effect and it really does work very well on foam, but it's still not perfect. It's still not Cylon because that's a very specific thing. Let's see. James Navarro asks, is there a dream project that I have in the back of my mind that I'm going to do? I want to do, and I don't think that I want to get a real quick to Godzilla cosplay. I've been a huge Godzilla fan. And the idea of, of the, the, the classic boilerplate Mecha Godzilla to me. And I've got a lot of reference materials, but I haven't started on that project because I need to finish the... the that was, that was one first. And another older one was uh, Akira's motorcycle. That would have been really fun to try and, and put together. But uh, actually building a working motorcycle is beyond me. So that's, that's not going to happen right now. <laughs> that's fine. But uh, Canada's bicycle, uh, motorcycle, definitely fun. Even though the center of gravity on that thing is so low, I wonder how well you would actually be able to ride it. I mean, the, the bottom is so wide, the center of gravity is so low, if you took a good turn, you're just gonna grind the bottom, but it's a cartoon, so it works. Uh, the first Dragon Master is asking, how do I put my templates onto the computer? For the most part, when I'm making my templates, um, you see that I'm doing it on paper by hand here at the table. Then I literally just scan them with a scanner, and then most of the time I'm using Photoshop because I know Photoshop really well to, to trace out my scans. Inkscape or uh, Illustrator is a much better way to do it because you're getting vector-based lines. Vector, is that the right word? No. But anyway, you're, the, the way it treats lines doesn't cause a pixelation problem uh, when you scale it. But I don't know those programs well enough to really make them work efficiently for me to get the templates done on time to get them put up. So I'm doing it all in Photoshop. <clears throat> so Tom Hunt is asking, other than Cloud's Buster Sword and the Gundam cosplay, what are some other projects I plan to do? This is a great one. Okay, so um, right now I am working on the staff from Onward. That's going to be next week's uh, video. Uh, one of the main things I'm trying to figure out uh, and get really kind of polished is the Phoenix gem because that's, that's kind of important. Uh, and, and I just did a poll on my Patreon for which Clone Wars uh, trooper helmet do we want to see next? 
and I had put up six different options. Well, it came around to being the end of the month and there was a three-way tie. So uh, I've got the Rex helmet finished. He's, he's back here. Um, I'm going to be working on, uh, there's an ARC Trooper helmet was one of the winners, which is very similar to Rex. Uh, I'll fix the chin. He's got a different, anyway, he's, he's similar. Um, there's the uh, Bad Batch Tech who's got a very unique helmet that's a mashup of a couple of different helmets, including a scout trooper. That was my choice. And then the third one is um, the Return of the Jedi helmet, because uh, a fun fan theory that was actually canon for like a minute was that uh, Rex, Captain Rex, was the bearded blonde guy in Return of the Jedi, part of Han's strike team going against the Imperial bunker that was on the forest moon of Endor. So we're making his helmet as well. I've actually been talking to uh, Felicia Cowley, who was just in this last week's episode, with getting the patterns made for the cloth parts of that helmet, because it's got a, a cloth part in the bottom and the top, and then it has uh, a bit of armor that goes around the top. So all three of those will be coming up, but not all in this month. Those will be spread out over you know, probably one a month, because I don't want to do a whole series of the same thing back to back to back. I like mixing it up and having different stuff come out every week. Uh, Greg, Greg is asking me, how am I handling quarantine? Okay, this is actually kind of funny. It, it really hasn't affected me much. I practically live at my shop anyway. Um, I mean, I, I don't, but I pretty much do. I've, I've, I've got a futon. I crash here a lot. So I've, I've pretty much been sheltering in place in my shop. Um, still go home, but um, <laughs> not much. So it really hasn't, I don't really feel like it's affected me much. I was kind of sheltering in place for months beforehand. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I just don't go outside as much now. <laughs> Looks like I'm getting close to, close to the end. Um, Joshua Hughes is asking, if I wanted to do a mask like Hollow Mask from Bleach, how would you make it look like it's seamlessly attached to my face without the straps being obvious? Well, that's a toughie. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't even picture the mask, hollow mask. But uh, if you're trying to do any kind of mask that attaches to your face seamlessly and doesn't have straps, that's makeup. We're doing right? it out of EVA. Uh, you still want to put it on your face? That's glue. We're using um, either spirit gum, which is one of the worst glues for long term. But uh, there's a product called Prozade. It's a mixture of, uh, of glue and latex. Uh, you can get that on Amazon or, or a costume shop. And um, Prozade will, will glue very well uh, and it, it will last for hours. Uh, some of the things that I've seen used and I have actually used in the past is a medical adhesive. This is used for different medical devices and things you have to glue to yourself. That will actually last all day and typically needs a, re a remover to actually remove it. Uh, so any of those things would be able to glue something to your, to your face without straps and last all day. So it looks like I'm getting close to the end of my half hour for QuarantCon. Uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you during this time. I don't intend on terminating my stream, but it is important to point out that if you've got the QuarantCon app, you can see exactly who's coming up at noon because there's another person coming on presenting at noon. And, um, and if not, then check out the satgeeks.com website for what their schedule is or uh, the QuarantCon on Facebook. But uh, I've enjoyed the half hour for that we've been here for the Corn Con. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and run over, I think. So what's what I got next? <laughs> Wibbly Keir is asking, how do I deal with overheating in my cosplay? Mostly I sweat. Uh, it's, it's, it's really not fair. Uh, so I have done a few big full body, full form, uh, full foam uh, cosplays in the past, back in... Ooh, what, 89, 90? I did Darkness from Legend, and this was sculpted out of couch foam and glued onto a Bart Simpson t-shirt and covered in latex. And then there is all the uh, foam and, and fabric that goes on top of it. So I, this, just Darkness from Legend, right? Basically, I'm wearing a couch. And yeah, uh, it gets incredibly hot, and you just, from time to time, slow down. Um, once I was foolish enough to wear it out in the sun, and uh, thankfully I had somebody take care of me because that was too much. Uh, I haven't really worked out a definitive way to deal with the overheating other than pay attention to your heart rate, pay attention to how you're feeling, and if you need to stop and take your helmet off, you, you pretty much should. 
Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, you need to stop and do that in an area that isn't ideal because there are characters where the helmet shouldn't come off and you don't want to be seen that way. You don't want pictures taken. But 